Hey, what's good, self-direct investors? I hope you're all doing great, and I want to welcome you back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Jordan. I'm the mind behind Make More Capital, and today we're going to recap this week in cannabis news from June 7th to the 13th. So before we jump in, if you enjoy this video or you learned something, please just leave a like on it as it really helps out my channel. And then, of course, if you want to learn how to take advantage of this generational investment opportunity, subscribe below so that you don't miss any future videos, and then there's plenty of content for you to go back and rewatch. I've tried to put all the facts and news and in one place so that you can go back and watch episodes over time to learn about the industry, identify top companies you keep seeing pop up, and then take advantage whenever you are ready. So today we're going to start with this US news article highlighting the six best cannabis stocks to buy as investors can take advantage of the dip in prices to buy the top cannabis stocks. Now we've seen articles like this before. No doubt it's good to see more positive exposure towards cannabis, but let's dive in just to see what the, the person that they feature in here, Jason Spadafora, says about what we can expect in the second half of 2021. Liquidity and prices in cannabis stocks dipped recently, so now is a good time to buy, as it really has been a good time to buy since, since March at least. Investors should prepare for liquidity in cannabis stocks to rise in August, says Jason Spadafora, uh, co-founder of CannabisStocks.com and head trader at True Trading Group. This is the time of year until early August where you can take a position in the space because when liquidity comes back, it will catch people off guard, he says. The only thing we've seen time and time again with cannabis is when the volume does come back, it is a moonshot. And that is definitely true from experience. But at the same time, what is he basing this information off of? I would imagine a lot of the reports from investment firms expecting a better second half of 2021 than we saw in the first, but I'll continue. Prices have dipped even though fundamentals have not changed, and first quarter earnings were solid, and that is 100% true, but higher expectations brought stock prices down, says Tim Seymour, founder of Seymour Asset Management in New York and portfolio manager of Amplify Seymour Cannabis ETF, ticker CNBS. After a major pullback, the fundamentals of cannabis companies have improved, and we're seeing a handful of catalysts ahead. He says, here are six cannabis cannabis stocks to consider adding to your portfolio. So as we go through them, I'm not going to read because I've covered all these, but they're, you know, you're, they're going to be familiar to you. So first one is Cureleaf Holdings. Pause to read if you want to go through this one. The next one, Cresco Labs, my largest holding. Pause to read if you want to hear this one. Next, we've got Trueleaf Cannabis, another one of the MSOs I own. Pause to read. After Trueleaf, we've got Green Thumb Industries. Then Terra Ascend Corp, pause to read if you want to check that out. And then lastly, Ascend Wellness Holdings. Now this company, Ascend Wellness Holdings, is a newer IPO. Again, it's not one of the companies I've really looked into a lot or covered much, mainly just because there's so many other companies that I've had my hands full that the more that just add on, I tend to stick to the ones that I've known for a while and that have been around for a decent amount of time. However, that was added to the list and you've got all of these here to look through. So if you've been watching this and you have a feeling that one of these companies is going to be big and as they're opening their 50th stores or 100 stores, think about in the long run how many stores they can eventually open or how many dispensaries, retail dispensaries they can actually open. Think McDonald's started with 100. They have 14,000 locations across the US. So maybe there's not going to be 14,000 cannabis dispensaries, but you've got a lot of room to grow, especially as this uh, industry starts to heat up. Now, as we move forward, this tweet from Todd Harrison prepare for Schumer pivot towards safe banking as his comprehensive bill likely gets pushed to the fall. Passing the SAFE Act looks increasingly more probable. This is from BTIG Security. So we'll read through it. What should you know? Um, passing the SAFE Act now looks increasingly more probable as Schumer just does not seem to have the votes. And although I wanted you know, I was hoping for the best, optimistic that he would get it. It's great that, again, we have actually a Senate Majority Leader that is willing to hopefully change his opinion based on the facts. And that would be big if, although he doesn't get the comprehensive bill, he's willing to move safe first, and then he can go back to that bill potentially in the fall or next year. But what we should know, we, like many, have been eagerly waiting for Senate Majority Leader Schumer to introduce his comprehensive cannabis reform bill that he has been touting for months. While, he can, while we continue to believe that Sen Schumer will introduce his bill, we now hear the timing could be pushed to later this fall. That is not to say he's moving away from supporting or passing cannabis legislation, quite the contrary. In fact, discussions with our Washington contacts confirm our view that Sen Schumer will likely pivot towards focusing on getting the SAFE Act through first, then transition to criminal justice reform, a decision we strongly support. The ramifications for such a move are significant in this pivot, as this pivot is ultimately the smarter political calculus to make, we believe, 
particularly considering the obstacles Senator Joe Manchin has become for the Democrats. Also, passing SAFE would be a significant benefit to the budding U.S. cannabis industry, in our view, providing both big U.S. MSOs and small social equity license recipient players alike the ability to access U.S. banking services without federal retribution. So if you can't get the votes for the comprehensive legalization bill, get SAFE done. So hopefully that's something we can expect in the coming months, and it seems like sources are pretty adamant this could happen. Why safe? Simply put, it has the votes. According to our Washington contacts, there is enough Republican support for safe to pass the Senate today. Recall the bill has six Republican co-sponsors. We have been in the opinion that the SAFE Act would serve many purposes for many people, as we detailed in our March 24th note. We believe the passage of the SAFE Act would be the triggering event that would cause FinCEN, which is the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, which is also a bureau of the United States Department of Treasury, to update its rules regarding AML activity and cannabis-related businesses. SAFE would not deschedule cannabis from the CSA Schedule 1 classification, but it would allow banks to offer financial services to MRBs, which are cannabis-related businesses or marijuana-related businesses, and thus would be in direct conflict with AML laws, thereby necessitating a rewriting of those laws. It is this rewriting event that we believe would provide enough safe harbor for U.S. exchanges to allow the U.S. MSOs and other plant-touching companies to uplist while also accessing U.S. capital markets. Further, with social equity licenses becoming increasingly important to states that have passed adult use legislation, like Illinois, New York, and New Jersey, access to banking services for these entrepreneurs is imperative for success. Senator Schumer understands this acutely, as his home state of New York is in the process of nominating its cannabis commission responsible for issuing social equity licenses. So, SAFE has to be done in order for New York and Illinois and New Jersey to provide the opportunities of social equity to their constituents. So again, better to get safe done than, than wait on it. And why now? Well, Senator Schumer realizes he does not have the votes to pass his comprehensive cannabis bill, not the 60 in the Senate as no Republican has signaled support, and not even the 50 from his own party. Also, there is a countdown clock to the midterms next year that is increasingly getting louder, thus creating a greater urgency to pass something. We're safe to pass. We believe the next piece of cannabis legislation Senator Schumer would take up would focus on criminal reform and social justice legislation. We suspect Senator Schumer would likely use this as his platform piece of legislation all through 2022 into the midterms for himself and the Democrats, which politically also does make a lot of sense. But, you know, SAFE helps investors, so that's something big for us. So what's next? We believe SAFE will most likely go through the Senate after the summer recess ends in late September or early October attached to a broader spending bill, example appropriations or ominous bill. There's even a small possibility that SAFE gets attached to the infrastructure bill slated for July 4th, something Rep. Ed Perlmutter is pushing for. So this gives us a bit more context as to why they're expecting a lot more volume to come in the second half of 2021 as well. So that's great news. Um, and I think, yes, ultimately, something is better than nothing. So if Schumer can pivot to this, that would be everything investors can really hope for. And then I just wanted to share this tweet from Michael Auerbach, investor and founder of Subversive Cap, giving his two cents, saying the slight delay in Schumer's bill is most likely related to FDA versus TTB jurisdiction. And the TTB is the Alcohol and Tobacco Tax and Trade Bureau. He says, my money is on TTB winning, prohibition is ending, interstate commerce will happen, social equity in righting the wrongs of prohibition is central to the post-prohibition cannabis economy. Now, without a doubt, I do believe it's going to happen, but clearly, as we can see in politics, the reality of it is things take a lot longer than we can anticipate. So regardless, though, it's great to see this progress, and just got to thank Twitter for allowing intelligent investors who have way more experience in this than I do share their opinions and adding this sort of angle to it, which I never would have considered in the first place. And clearly, him and Todd are friends, so it's great to have these people sharing their thoughts and then sharing it out to us. And then we have this tweet from Todd as well. Google U.S. cannabis incrementalism, and you might find this type of approach. And when five or six sources are saying the same thing over and over again, safe coming this year because Shooms is boxed in on New York Social Justice Pledge, perhaps that's something worth noting, if not sharing on Twitter. And so Natalie Furtig, again, he, she is the cannabis policy cover. She covers cannabis policy on Politico. Asked Dan Sullivan from Alaska, this week what federal cannabis reform looks like to him. He said giving states more protections through the Safe Banking and the States Act, but not removing all federal penalties from cannabis. That again is ridiculous to me, but you know, slow and steady incremental steps is better than one big thing happening at once too, and then you know creating a big mess because of that. So just wanted to share this. It just gives more cadence to the fact that this seems to be what can get passed 
and hopefully this is what we're going to see happen, um, you know, maybe in the summer, maybe in the fall, but sooner than later. And then Rosie Matteo, who is a, a head of a global PR agency specializing in cannabis and lifestyle, sharing this. It's awesome to see cannabis represented at such high-profile conference. Um, it, you know, first of many, I imagine, but they, um, it seems Ben Kovler and Kim Rivers will be speaking at the J.P. Morgan Robin Hood Investors Conference on June 16th. Great ambassadors for the cannabis industry. I would rather, I wouldn't want anyone other than Ben speaking there, to be, to be honest, as well. So it's just great to see that we're getting CEOs from the cannabis space going to speak with JP Morgan and Robinhood investors. So they're going to, you know, be shining a light on an industry that these in institutions haven't been paying attention to whatsoever, but should have been, you know, over time. Now, on to some MSO news as TrueLeaf completes acquisition of Saliva Wellness in West Virginia. This now gives them its three West Virginia dispensary permits. Now, the total transaction was for $650,000. So think about it. That's how much it costs just to get three dispensary permits to open up. Saliva was awarded two permits in Morgantown and one in Parks Parkersburg in January 2021 as part of the West Virginia application process. These locations, combined with TrueLeaf's dispensary permits, are spread across five counties and include a number of the largest populated areas in the state. So completing this transaction broadens our presence in West Virginia with the addition of Salivo West Virginia and our recently announced transaction of Mountaineer Holdings. True Leave now has cultivation, production, and nine dispensary permits in the state, giving them a solid footprint in West Virginia when that medical and eventual adult use system does come online. As CEO Kim Rivers of True Leave is also happy to announce that they've opened their 89th store in the U.S., the new Tampa, Florida dispensary joins other True Leave locations in the area. So they continue to expand in their dominant state of Florida, and they just bought Harvest to get that dominant position in Arizona, and then, as we can see, they're getting a solid footprint in West Virginia, too. So gotta love to see that. On to Cresco Labs diversifying their edibles and vape portfolio through Good News brand expansion. So under its social occasion-based Good News brand, Cresco is launching Counting Sheep, Day Off, and Pride products in edible and vape forms in California, Illinois, and Michigan, three states where they are heavy in wholesale. Counting Sheep represents the company's first product made with CBN, one of the compounds other than THC and CBD, which is very interesting. I'd love to try that. Day Off is a product featuring CBD, and Pride, a sativa-forward product, is available for limited time during Pride Month in select markets. So why build on these? Well, apparently the edible category continues to demonstrate growth across all markets. Per BDSA analytics, edibles saw a 31% increase in sales year over year. Gummies showed notable strength, growing 5% quarter over quarter, resulting in a new high of $252 million in total total gummy retails in Q1 of 2021 alone. Vapes have also seen an increase in market performance. According to BDSA, the vapes category across all markets has increased sales by 27% year over year. With the launch of Counting Sheep, Day Off and Pride, Cresco continues to diversify its wholesale portfolio Excuse me, and build a strong presence within the edibles and vapes category. Better, them, better to have them do this early than do it later on as well. So love to see them expanding into these key states with lots of populations and lots of sales. And then on to Columbia Care, completing their acquisition of Greenleaf Medical Cement's market-leading position in Mid-Atlantic. So this affirms the company's position as a leading cultivator, processor, and wholesale supplier and retailer in limited license states of Maryland, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Virginia. And it also adds approximately 400 thousand square feet of cultivation and production capacity as well as four operational dispensaries and six in development dispensaries in key markets so for 10 total dispensaries and a lot of cultivation space that seems to be a good deal so if we look down the total upfront consideration was approximately 240 million compared to 45 million in cash and 195 million in columbia care stock with the potential for additional performance-based milestones in 2022 and 2023. So let's see what they got out of this Greenleaf Q1 2021 financial performance. Their revenue is approximately 29 million. So that's one quarter, 29 million. If we look at that over four quarters, multiply it by four without any growth, that's just 120 million in revenue. Gross margins in excess of 50%. So either 15 million of 29 million or 60 million of 120 million in revenue with adjusted EBITDA margin in excess of 30 percent. So then if we just scroll back up to see, it's immediately accretive to Columbia Care's gross margin, adjusted EBITDA, and free, ca free cash flow. So they believe that they're buying this company at a discounted price, like they're getting a steal for it with the acquisition multiple of approximately 4.8x 2021 adjusted EBITDA. So how can we relate that to what they paid? Well, 4.8x would be four times earnings, and so again, if we look, 29 million times four, about 120 million. If we look at the gross margin, so the actual earnings from that revenue, 50% of 29 million, so 15, 30, 45, 60. 
spread out for the whole year, times 4, that's 60, 120, 180, 240. That's a 4x multiple of their current earnings based on what we're seeing right here. So that does show justification for the 240 million. And you can imagine those sales are going to grow, which is why they paid a little more than 4x, but you can see that they're very happy with paying this amount for what they got as they achieve total vertical integration in all 18 of Columbia Cares markets, enabling the company to launch brands across the country, expand retail and wholesale market share, optimize margin profile, and drive shareholder value. It's like they're aiming big like Cureleaf, they're just not there yet. On to Florida sales from the Office of Medical Cannabis Use, we can see that they've gotten up to 573,000 patients, so that is an increase of 3,800 from last week. And if we scroll down, we can see Trulieve did add that one dispensary. While the quantity of cannabis sold remains very strong and signaling growth, as we can see milligrams of THC, milligrams of CBD, and smokable flour remain strong. Now, although I've been focusing on smokable flour over the past few weeks and highlighting whenever Trulieve happens to sell more than a ton of cannabis flour, I want to draw your attention to the milligrams of THC sold this past week, because they managed to sell 107,000 milligrams of THC, and that seems like quite a bit. So keep that number in mind, 107,000. And if we just switch the 11 to 04, which represents June 4th, a week ago, we can check out what they sold in milligrams of THC last month, last week, sorry. And just look, there's going to be a big difference. 107,000 this week. If we go to last week, June 4th, we can see they just did 76,000. So whatever they've done, they've either, I think, created a new product with some of their flour that is a very high THC, some sort of a concentrate. And, you know, that's where a lot of sales in this last week went to because that number skyrocketed. So regardless, these numbers will always vary. But the one thing that we can highlight is that the sales are strong and they are continuously growing as, you know, Florida is bringing on new patients. And we can anticipate that every other state that becomes more flexible and their medical cannabis laws are also just going to be bringing in patients and as they educate those patients they're going to bring in more and more and it's just a, a vicious cycle that goes in the right direction helping people move off of addictive opioids into healthier alternatives. Now on to states and legislative changes we can see from Arkansas medical cannabis approaching 50,000 pounds in sales and they're proud of that as Arkansas medical cannabis sales have recently surpassed 330 million and is fast approaching 50,000 pounds in sales within the next week according to the Department of Finance and administration. Since the first dispensary opened in mid-2019, Arkansans, Arkansans have spent $33.4 million to obtain 48,914 pounds of medical cannabis. There are currently 33 dispensaries in operation throughout Arkansas, with five that are working towards opening for business, as 38 dispensaries have been licensed in all. And the Arkansas Department of Health reports that 77,000 active patients' cards active patient cards have been administered. So think about that. Obviously, Arkansas has a much lower population than Florida, but 77,000 patients active, while Florida has 21 million people, 573,000 patients active, 21 million people. There's so much room to grow, not just in Florida, but in Arkansas and every single other state out there. On to Wyoming, as voters could see two cannabis ballot measures in 2022 under libertarian-led push, which would be great. While the text of either 2022 measure has not yet been released, a new advisory from the Libertarian Party, which plans to formally file the proposals on Friday, describes the goal as being to legalize medical cannabis and decriminalize cannabis for personal use. So that's a step in the right direction for Wyoming. As a poll released in December found that 54% of state residents support allowing adults in Wyoming to legally possess cannabis for personal use, presumably that would mean that the more modest proposals stand to pass if they're certified for the ballot. And Wyoming's neighbors, Montana and South Dakota, were among several states that approved cannabis legalization ballot measures in November as voters voted for cannabis, not against it. So the tide is turning. Great to see some of these other states jumping on board finally as Virginia unveils its new cannabis legalization website. So this is an update from Virginia. As, as if you can believe this is crazy, but cannabis becomes legal in the Commonwealth in just a few weeks on July 1st. So, you know, we're just outside of the, the real start of summer. But on Thursday, the state unveiled a new website that breaks down what's allowed and what's not allowed once the law changes. So starting on July 1, those 21 and older will be allowed to possess up to one ounce of cannabis and adults can also grow up to four plants in their homes. However, retail sales may start in 2024 pending another vote by the general assembly next year so keep in mind this does seem just more of a politician show off to hope in hopes of getting re-elected as opposed to actually getting something going sooner than later but again legalizing and ending the criminalization in virginia is better than keeping the status quo alive so love to see that and then just to highlight uh, in one tweet from todd here as 
As we did see some delays in Connecticut and Delaware, but thank you, Todd, for sharing this from Cowan, the investment firm, as CTs, Connecticut's cannabis legalization bill is likely to pass in a special session before the month's end. The next states to watch for the balance of 2021 are Delaware and Rhode Island. And then going into 2022, we will be watching for ballot initiatives for adult use in Oklahoma, Ohio, and Missouri. Excuse me, and for medical use in Idaho, a state that was anti-cannabis completely, say what? And Nebraska. While Connecticut legalization likely in the extra session, lawmakers in Connecticut yesterday decided to punt their cannabis legislation effort to special session later this month. Nevertheless, we believe Connecticut will likely be the third state to legalize cannabis in a special session this year after Virginia and New Mexico, as the delay appears to be due to lack of time rather than to votes. And legislative changes are not done because guess what? Even out of Texas and Louisiana, governors signal they'll sign cannabis reform bills on their desk, which is progress in these very red states. Texas Governor Greg Abbott left no room for interpretation on how he would act on a medical cannabis expansion measure that the legislator sent him, legislator sent him saying, veterans could qualify for medical cannabis under our new law, he tweeted, I will sign it. Obviously, this bill could be improved, but getting it done first is a huge step, and then we can make those amendments along the way. While Louisiana Governor John Bell Edwards was less explicit, stating at a press briefing that he's interested in signaling the bill that would lessen the penalties for possessing small amounts of cannabis, the governor noted that some reporters may be surprised to hear he's inclined to approve the cannabis decriminalization measure, referring to his longtime opposition to broad legalization. That said, other recent comments Edwards has separately made signaled that he may be increasingly open to even more comprehensive proposals to completely end cannabis prohibition if they are ever sent to his desk. When it comes to the current decriminalization measure, he said, Said, him and his staffs are reviewing that one now. So positive sentiment again out of states where you would least expect to see cannabis reform coming. So it just goes to show that over time, slowly but surely. And then as you get older, things you previously imagined could never have happened start to happen. That is the beauty of life. Now, on a bit of a world tour before we end this, over to Canada, Ontario's privately owned cannabis store is reopening to customers Friday. I live in Ontario, Canada, and we've been on pretty much lockdown what feels like since January, just because cases continue to spike and we try to get vaccinations up. But regardless, this is good news because LPs in their recent earnings showed some pretty dismal numbers, and their excuse was that because of the stores were closed so that you could not actually go in, speak to a bud tender, and learn about the product that you wanted to buy. That was a reason for the decrease in sales. But good news, Hundreds of privately owned cannabis retailers across Canada are preparing to open their doors to in-store customers Friday as the province enters the first phase of its reopening plan with COVID vaccinations ramping up. Non-essential retail, including adult-use cannabis stores in Canada's largest consumer market, will be permitted to open with 15% customer capacity as to the province's rules. However, the good news is that licensed stores will be allowed to continue providing products via curbside pickup and delivery to temporary provisions granted by the province. Now, this obviously facilitates and just makes it easy for sales of you know, previous cannabis consumers, but it's the new consumers that want to go in and try something that gets, you know, this gets new buyers into the store to try new things. So this will help Canadian LPs a lot as experts attribute the growth to an increasing number of stores, falling prices, and growing product selection as Toronto had seven legal cannabis stores in January of 2020 and almost 90 by December of that same year. And they continue to open 120 stores a month in the most populated province so they can properly supply the demand. On to Quebec, our second most populated province is happy to announce profits nearly double in a year, bringing in $188 million in profits and taxes, with more than twice as much product sold as last year. Now, I imagine Quebec lawmakers are happy that they're making money, but the thing is they could be making way more if they decided to open enough stores. It's ridiculous. Mind you, financial results for the Société Québécoise du Cannabis, SQDC, for 2020 to 2021 indicate the agency made a net profit of $66 million and provided Quebec with $122 million in tax revenue for a total of $188 million. Federal revenues also benefited from the SQDC's operations in the form of $50 million in taxes. And this year's results are a little more than double than those for the previous year as the SQDC sold 91.5 tons of product last year, generating revenue of 537 million compared with 47 tons sold for 311 million a year earlier. But get this, the agency also opened 25 new sales points last year, bringing the total stores to 66. So they could be making way more money if they wanted to when you consider the fact Quebec has 8 million people and they did just 537 million. 
Colorado has 5.7 million people, and they last month brought in 202 million, last month alone. So it's funny that Quebec law, Quebec's lawmakers are celebrating the little bit of money that they're making when like, they could just be making so much more if they properly supplied the demand and opened double, triple, or quadruple the amount of retail outlets that they have. So, you know, if Montreal did that, or if Quebec did that, then it would be right in line with Ontario, and Canada's sales would be growing a lot faster. But but that's the Quebec monopoly for you. On to some science, a study, evaluation of patient reported safety and efficacy of cannabis from a survey of medical cannabis patients in Canada. So just wanna scroll down to the conclusion, just to highlight the main line here, which I think is conclusive in itself. Aligning with previously published studies, we report that over 60% of the medical cannabis cohort reported improvements in their medical conditions. Thus, we conclude that in general, this real world data shows that a large proportion of medical cannabis patients report moderate to substantial benefits from cannabis, both in terms of their overall condition and overall general well being. And if 60% is an indication of anything, it's more people than not. While these results are promising, cannabis treatment was not a remedy for all. Yeah, we know that. No one's saying it's a remedy for all. As our findings show that medical cannabis did not lead to significant improvements in all conditions we examined. That's fine. Just thank you for showing us the evidence that we need, which is again, 60% is more than 50%. So this evidence that keeps piling up and mounting tells us that for more people than not, cannabis helps them, which is why we need to make medical cannabis at least accessible for everyone that needs it for medical reasons, and then for recreational purpose to each and everyone's own. And then around the globe to Scotland, their first patients prescribed legal cannabis. Um, this is an article sort of highlighting just basically why people wanted to try medical cannabis. So it doesn't really give us any sort of update, but what this is, is again, a positive news article from the BBC.com getting pushed out there and showing people that, hey, other countries are making progress towards cannabis and making it more accessible for medicinal purposes. And then we jump over to Spain as Congress to consider regulating cannabis with medicinal uses. So the plenary of Congress has definitively approved the creation of a subcommittee in order to analyze experiences of regulation of cannabis for medicinal use. As the subcommission will be put together to analyze the experiences promoted by governments of different countries and the regulation of cannabis for medical use, as well as the existing scientific evidence in this regard. Its purpose will be to know these experiences as well as to listen to the voices of as many agents as it deems appropriate so that in a rigorous and scientific way it serves us to advance the necessary legislative changes and respond to so many people and groups of patients as well as medical and scientific professionals who demand its regulation. So positive news out of Spain as well. Hopefully more European countries can take this sort of approach towards medical first then eventually adult use. But we're not even through the first inning yet so investors stay patient and remember this. The training wheel years are behind us and the decade of cannabis is still ahead of us and we're only just beginning so that is it for this week's episode of this week in cannabis news everyone let me know in the comments what you think is safe gonna pass in the summer or the fall I'm not sure but regardless it's a matter of when not if so i'm very excited for when that day does come but let me know in the comments what you think i'd love to start a discussion that being said if you enjoyed this video please leave a like on it subscribe if you don't want to miss any new videos and i will catch you on wednesday for a midweek update have a great day everybody